This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it either by its hosts or any guests is to be construed as psychological, medical, or legal advice. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. I'm Haley Radke. Today, Leah Cooper shares how listening to hours and hours and hours of adoptees, birth families, and adoptive parents sharing their stories led her to what she calls her volcano of grief. Leah was part of a team that created a play called In My Heart, The Adoption Play Project that has now transformed into a graphic novel. We discuss how the impact of unpacking her adoption experience has led to both hard and good things in her life. We wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website adoptieson.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Leah Cooper. Welcome, Leah. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'd love it if you would start by sharing some of your story with us. I was born in Los Angeles in 1968. I don't have a lot of information about my placement. I know that I was placed for adoption at birth. I know that I am multiracial, but they didn't tell me what kind of multiracial. They said you're white and something else, which put me on the hard to place list, you know. And I do know that I was in foster care, but I don't know for how long or how many placements. And I know that I was adopted because my mother saw me on TV. My adoptive mother was watching a talk show called the Ben Hunter Talk Show. And I guess like once a week, they would bring on the hard to place babies, you know, and flash an 800 number. And my mom called the number and said, I want that one on the left, you know. And um, I, maybe because I was hard to place, she was able to pretty much arrange the whole thing before she even really checked in with my dad on the plans. Yeah, he tells this story that he came home from work one day and she said, sell your motorcycle, we're getting a kid. And uh, that was the first they talked about it. <laughs> yeah, and so... So you just can't see my face. She's laughing yeah. at my face. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I feel like I grew up hearing all about that motorcycle that he gave up. <laughs> so yeah, but as he, my dad also would say that, you know, the moment they put me in his arms, he fell in love and, you know, he was on board from then on. So I was adopted at about 10 weeks old, I think, was when the official adoption date happened. You know, so I think there must have been some foster placement in between, but I don't have very much information. And, you know, it was a it was that 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 era of adoption. My parents were told, you know, don't hide it from her, but don't make a big deal about it. You know, so I don't remember being told. I always grew up knowing. In fact, I I thought it was fun. You know, I would tell people a lot. I think a lot of us adoptees do that. We're like, I'm adopted. I'm adopted. I'm adopted. And everybody's like, oh, that's so interesting. I'm so interesting. It's like your special fact. And then the thing is, I, I do look sort of ethnically vague. <laughs> and so people, I got that question, what are you a lot? And I didn't know. And so what I had been told by my adoptive parents was that my mother was white and that she didn't know who the father was, or she didn't know what race he was, or maybe there was more than one, or, you know, who knows, it was the 60s, you know, free love, who knows, maybe she was a prostitute, you know, like they, they sort of had fun, I don't know, speculating at these stories, but at the end of the day, I still didn't know what my ethnicity was, and they sort of speculated, they, you know, they would look at me kind of sideways and be like, you're probably Mexican, or, you know, maybe part black, and, uh, and they would tell me what I looked like when they first brought me home, you know. Um, cause I guess I was bald and it took some while, a while for the hair to come in and whatever. Anyway. So I would tell this to friends. I don't know. My parents think maybe I'm Mexican, maybe I'm black. I don't know. And then they'd all speculate, you know, like you do with a dog at the dog park. Oh, I think you're this. Oh, you think you're that. And, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, I had, I had friends all across the spectrum of race and, and I, I loved it when people would go, oh, you're one of ours. <laughs> and I had a godmother who was black, who would say, oh, no, honey, you're definitely one of ours. And I, I think I grew up loving the idea that I could be anybody's, really. I generally felt like I had pretty positive feelings about it. You know, I got the you're chosen, you're special, all that stuff. I mean, in the story about being on TV, that made it that much more special, right? So I'll flash forward many, 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 many years. And um, I will say, 
I grew up, my, my adoptive family had a lot of mental illness, actually, and a lot of dysfunction and a lot of good intentions. But, you know, in the end, it was actually a pretty unsupervised, neglectful household. I'm the only one in my whole family who doesn't have a mental illness or a disability or both. And so sometimes I had to kind of be the mediator between my family and the rest of the world. And I think, you know, I think as adoptees, we kind of um, traverse difference you know, and live in the margins really well because we want to please. And that was me. I was definitely like, oh, could everybody just be happy? I just want everybody to be happy. Mm, No yelling, no not liking each other, no crazy. I'll make it all smooth, you know. So I grew grew up to be somebody who was super aware and empathic around difference and marginalization and outsiderness. Like my family were outsiders and I wasn't even out, an outsider among them. So, I, you know, I just I think I grew up embracing that my superpower was being the outsider among the outsiders and bringing everybody in. And so anyway, I'll flash forward to adulthood and I found myself working in the arts and inclusive arts really specifically. And I worked in theater for a long time, but I also did a lot of activism and a lot of organizing. And and then one day I sort of was like, how can I put these things together? And I started this this theater company that that makes plays based on the stories of people who haven't been included. And we were trying to think of like, you know, our next project, what community has really great stories. And I still don't remember who said it, but somebody was like, Leah, your story is cool. What if we played a play about adoption? And I was like, huh? Well, I guess so. I mean, you know, I don't have a lot of feelings about being adopted, but probably other people do. (laughs) And so, yeah, now I laugh really hard at my naivety about my own experience. So how, because what what decade of life would you have been in when that started? (laughs) Let me think. Let's see. We started this project in 2013 and I was born in 1968. So I was 45. Okay. I was that far along in life, not necessarily knowing all the reasons why I was the way I was and still not out of the fog. So I was like, yeah, I've read some books and I have some other friends and I, you know, there are great stories. Let's do this. I don't have any feelings about it at all. This will be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, the work, the work that my company does is, is holding space for some really big emotional experiences. And so you know, we proceeded to do story circles, reaching out and talking to a lot of adoptees and adoptive parents and birth parents and social workers and everybody in the community. And people kept handing me books. And, and I'm the one in the company who reads all the books, you know, but there were certain books I just never got around reading. And one of them was The Primal Wound because I was like, Primal Wound, come on. And and that cover, you know, it just looks so... <laughs> <laughs> so the little tiny baby in this big cloud of sadness. And I was like, I don't relate to that at all. This book, whatever. But I read Kinship by Design. And I read, you know, I read all these books that talked about the systems and the the structures of bureaucracy that make choices. And, you know, so I kind of snuck up on the topic and found myself getting kind of gradually, slowly, subtly enraged on behalf of other people, not for myself, mind you. Oh, not for you. No, no, no. <laughs> for all these other people. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, that I'll, you know, I'll skip forward and say that like the process of doing this was a process of slowly unfolding my awareness until like suddenly it was all, I call it my volcano of grief that started, you know, erupting inside of me, even as we were trying to write a play with hundreds of peoples of stories in it. And it was my job to hold space for th- their catharsis, you know, and, and not for mine. Yeah. So we did, though. We wrote a play. We uh, the, the work we do is uh, not documentary. We usually pick a piece of, of literature or fiction that most people will know that we think can be a container for the themes that come up in a community. For the adoption community, we settled on Alice in Wonderland because it's about somebody who goes down a a rabbit hole and discovers a lot more about who she is and how big or small she is. And there's all these illusions that get exploded. And then there's all these people judging. And I mean, really every chapter in Alice in Wonderland had something that was a metaphor for the community. So we were like, yes, this. Oh, so brilliant. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, so we did, we spent three years on this project and gathered literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories um, across the spectrum. And 
simultaneously, it was this amazing artistic experience. And I could not have been more proud of the play when it finally happened. For our plays, we actually invite people who are in the community to be in them alongside professional actors. So, But we ask people to usually play somebody different than themselves. So we had like adoptees playing adoptive parents and birth parents playing adoptees and so forth. And so, you know, so for everybody involved, it was kind of this big catharsis, right? Because they're bearing witness to somebody else's experience in their own community. And but they're also hearing words they've spoken about themselves being spoken on stage, you know, so it's a lot. Anyway, the show was huge. We sold out every performance and the the lobby was filled with people there with their families crying and hugging and saying, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. And meanwhile, inside, I have this volcano erupting. And um, after the show closed, I feel like I laid down and didn't get up for like a month. You know, I was just wiped out. And then I then I had to kind of go deal with all this stuff that came up for me. Well, can you can you tell me what it was like to be in a story circle with <laughs> folks kind of sharing their story? And, you know, you said you're you're realizing this volcano is kind of like coming. It's here. But what was it like for Leah, the adoptee, to be hearing those <laughs> stories after a while of repetitive yeah. things and themes, I'm sure, coming out? Well, you know, it varied a lot depending on who was in the circle. So, you know, for our work, sometimes we we have a story circle that has many people within the community, all with different points of view. And sometimes they're really focused, like only the adoptees, only birth parents, only adoptive parents. And, I, you know, whenever it was story circles with just adoptees, there was this little voice inside me going, I'm not the only one who's weird like this. Wow. You know, and that, so that's going off and it's actually really validating and feels kind of good, but also terrifying. Like, how can this be true that this weird little thing I thought nobody knew about me is kind of universal among these other people. Right. So that was, as one experience. And then I remember the first story circle that was all birth parents. There's this organization concerned United birth parents and they hosted a story circle and it was, it was all moms, you know, there weren't any dads. I don't know why that's how it is, but that's how it is. And I remember partway into that story circle, I realized these were the first birth moms I'd ever met. And that all my life, a birth mom was like a cartoon picture. It was not a real human being. It was just this like bubble of an idea that I had never dared to humanize, you know, and now sitting in front of me were all of these women crying. And, and a lot of them were really nice. And they all wanted to hug me. <laughs> you know, and so I, I was I just I had mixed feelings, you know, one feeling was, oh, my gosh, I had no idea they would be this nice. If my birth mother was half this nice, I think I might like to meet her. <laughs> and it had never, that had never occurred to me before. But on the other hand, I was also like, oh my gosh, you're all hugging me. And I kind of feel like you're trying to eat my soul, mm. you know, because I don't think I can fill the hole that you're trying to fill. Cause it's not really about me specifically, you know, so that was a lot. And I, I remember walking away from that going, whoa, I don't know what to do with all these feelings. But then, you know, there were a lot of adoptive parents too. And I didn't, you know, I didn't empathize as much. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> and I was like, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, you couldn't conceive and you're really upset about that. But, you know, I just couldn't bring myself to care as much. And then I felt bad because in that moment, it was my job to sort of empathize and receive all the stories. Is is that really what, um, uh, what came out a lot was the infertility piece? Well, in certain, in certain circles, that's what they wanted to share. Mm -hmm. I mean, it varied. I think, you know, there was, there, there were some people where they were really focused on how hard it was to get to the place where they had a child, whatever that took, whether that was the conception part not working or that was how ar arduous the adoption process was. And then there were other circles where there was a guy who, you know, we do these story circles and we set a time limit. Each person gets to talk for a certain amount of time. So everybody gets to talk, right? This guy, he'd had such a painful experience with his daughter really kind of waking up in adolescence and just having such a hard time. And she ultimately ran away and lived on the streets for a long, long time. And he felt so sad and scared and guilty and angry. And and he did not honor the time limit. He just kept talking and talking and talking. And, you know, and part of me is just like, 
really empathizing for him and worrying about his daughter, but also like, dude, are you ever going to stop talking? Cause there's 15 other people here, you know, but then when he finally got to the end of his story and he passed it around, his whole body changed. He kind of, you know, he kind of just settled down. And then I noticed he started listening to everybody else. And when it came back around to him, he was in a much more um, listening space and a less narcissistic place. And ultimately he ended up being in the play and being this like really generous person, you know? So it was kind of this little lesson in like people have their grief and they need to get it out or they're just stuck in it forever, you know? But I'll share this. There was one story circle Usually we go in as a team of three, you know, like one or two of us facilitating and one recording and one timekeeping. But for whatever reason, nobody in the company was available or people had to cancel. It just turned out it was only me. And it was a story circle arranged by a woman who had come to another story circle. And she said, I don't think you're getting enough of, of the adoptive parents story in this. Yeah, I know. Right. I'm sorry. I'm reacting to your face. I'm grimacing. <laughs> I'm grimacing. I know because I'm like, yeah, I feel like you guys always get to tell this story. But but she was saying there's a there's a pretty specific experience of a lot of adoptive parents not being prepared for how much trouble their their child's going to have in adolescence. And she said, I have a support group of other adoptive parents who've had a really tough time. And I wonder if you'd come to that group because I think you need their point of view. And I was like, sure, of course, we always want to hear from everybody. So I went and this is the one where I ended up all by myself. And there's like 20 adoptive parents in there and they all have the experience of like, my adoptee lost their mind and I wasn't prepared. (laughs) Right. And I will say that was the story circle I was not prepared for because I, I was like, wow, I didn't realize how hard you all have it. And I also wasn't ready for you to be so angry at your adoptee about that. And that, that I have to admit, I walked away from that and I just, I feel like I had to go lay down for like a week. Cause I was like, I don't have a place for your anger. I just don't. But I understand it because I know you had a hard time and and because you wanted to be a, you wanted to you wanted to be able to help your adoptee and you absolutely didn't know how. And so even though that was kind of the worst story circle for me and I kind of was mad at the rest of the company, I was like, I shouldn't have been at that alone, <laughs> you know, because none of those none of those folks were talking to me like an adoptee. They forgot I was an adoptee. They were, I was their receptacle for their their heartbreak. And so I, for, I was mad at first. I was like, ah, I shouldn't have been the one to receive all that. But on the other hand, that became this like real, it cracked open the story for me, which is that everybody involved in adoption is underprepared. <laughs> if, if they're not told, hey, this whole thing started with loss for everybody. And, and, and there's going to be, there's going to be grief and, and it's going to come out sideways. And I was just really struck by that being the story, actually. Yeah. So it was different. Every story circle was different, but they were all hard. <laughs> mm. I I mean, I I relate to some of what you shared because I've heard so many adopted people tell their story and I've heard several mothers and, you know, the handful of adoptive parents, but not to that extent of, but uh, yeah, I just like feel, I felt it <laughs> when you were talking about it, how hard <laughs> that would be. So will you tell us about the volcano? Oh, sure. I guess it started when I finally did read The Primal Wound, right? Because people kept handing me that book or telling me, you need to read it, you need to read it. And there was there was one adopted person involved in the production who was maybe the most generous and the most wise. I mean, it's hard to rank, but anyway, her name is Penny. And not only was she an adoptee, but she was somebody who had organized support groups in middle schools and high schools for other adoptees. And she'd been doing this for decades. She was a teacher, right? So she had really been carrying a lot of people's stories and holding space for a lot of people. And she was the one who who would often give me a special insight into something. And and she was the one who grabbed my hand at one point and said, you, you have to read The Primal Wound. You can't do this project if you don't read that book. And she, you know, and she did that thing, you know, where she looked me really in the eye and into my heart. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. And so I, I went home and I opened it up and I thought, you know, I'll read the first chapter. And I read that book cover to cover. I just sat down and and didn't get up because I was riveted. I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Somebody wrote a user manual to me <laughs> and nobody told me about it. I was, when I was done, I threw that book against the wall so hard. I think I made a dent in the wall because I was so mad that nobody told me there was all this 
really important information, you know, because I was like, oh, this is me. Every chapter in here, this is, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. Yep, I did that. Yep, I did that. Yep, I did that. You know, like it was just, it was like somebody had been following me around all my life from the inside. And then it became really personal. And uh, this realization that, that this cover of this book that little baby on that cover was me. You know, and, and I had thoroughly rejected that idea. I was like, I'm no victim. I'm fine. You know? So that was probably when it began. <laughs> it's when the, it started simmering. Because this is still while you're writing the play. Still trying to write the play. And I should I should be really clear. It was co-written, right? We're mm-hmm, an ensemble mm-hmm. and there's me and a co-artistic director. His name is Alan. And we co-write and co-direct everything. But I was the only one who was adopted, who's writing this. And so I kept trying to keep me out of it. And then me would sneak into it. And then I'd kick me back out of it because I didn't want it to be that personal. But I will say, you know, this kind of work, the 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 true north of the compass is what is the truth? What was told to us? You know, when we write these plays, all the words in the plays come from something somebody actually said from firsthand experience. That's like one of our rules. So I was able to kind of keep myself out of it because I had the words of hundreds of other people to honor, people who trusted us with their most vulnerable story, people who frankly were way braver than I was. They came in and said, I've been crying for three years. Let me tell you my story. And I'm like, "Hmm, yeah, yeah, let me write that down. I don't cry like that. Yep. Got it. You know, so, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, getting the play up was about honoring the people who trusted us and honoring the people in the room. So somehow we wrote this thing and it, I think it was really good. I felt really, really good about it. You know, and that's what held me up was seeing people feel validated, feel seen, feel understood, watching them. Oh, I mean, like there were people, there was somebody in the play who got reunited with his birth mother while we were in rehearsal. And and then and then he brought her to the play, right? And we all came out afterwards and got to meet her. That, you know, so those moments are, were like, oh my gosh, this woman, Sandy Whitehawk, who has organized an, a, a powwow for Native adoptees to, to reconnect to tribes, she invited me early on to come to one. And it was this really personally powerful experience for me. And we, we put the story of the powwow in the play. And, and with her permission, we, we were able to, you know, get an audio recording from it and include it in the performance. And then here's the other thing is it's an annual event. The powwow came up again while we were in rehearsal on the play. And I was like, well, you know, we have all these adoptees in the production. Do you think they could come? She's like, oh, they have to be in it. They have to be in the ceremony. So we brought all the adoptees who were in the cast to the powwow and they all got to be part of that which is an experience of spending all day doing all these ceremonies that culminates in all of these, all like so many Native American people grabbing them by the arm and saying, welcome home, welcome home, welcome home, you know, which was just, oh, oh, I can't even explain how deep that goes in your bones to have somebody look you in the eye and say, welcome home, right? So, so I was sort of held aloft by all of these amazing experiences that happened and all of these brave people who were part of it. But like I said, the show closed and I just collapsed. I, I had the flu and an ear infection and pneumonia all at the same time. <laughs> you just fell apart, Leah. I just fell apart. And then I'll be really honest, my marriage fell apart not long after mm, that. I'm and sorry. and then I spent, I think I spent six months crying every single day. Yeah. And I just, luckily I had all these really, I have good friends and I had and I, and by this point, I knew a lot of people in the adoption community. So I started reaching out and I was like, um, I can't seem to stop crying. <laughs> Is this normal? You know, and I had a lot of people go, yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You want to hug? It'll pass. It'll pass. Don't worry. You're okay. You're okay. And l- luckily lots of people were like, you're okay. And I, I, that was my coming out of the fog, you know, was just like weeping, but it, I, I'm so grateful. It wasn't this sort of, I don't know why I'm weeping. I was like, oh, I know exactly why. Cause I have all these other stories to tell me exactly what this is. And then I think I sort of found my way to strength through those connections and through this understanding that it was also in my body, you know, that it just had to work its way through like trauma, basically. Mm-hmm. So the cool thing is so many people saw this play that wanted more people to see this play that people were like, when are you doing it again? When are you doing it again? And um, for a while I was like, oh, I don't know. We're never doing anything like that again. (laughs) I'm not sure I can handle it. But 
frankly, on the on the other side, and I think you know anybody who's come through the fog with enough support knows that there's kind of this like big bonus on the other side where you're like, oh, now I can be myself and be vulnerable. You know, I can be, I can be imperfect. I can, I can say some days I'm not up to this or that. And I can say, hmm, there's some parts of love I'm not as good at right off the bat. I need more time. You know, like, I guess what I want to say is when people wanted more, there, there was a version of me that could show up into that because, I had found a way to to bring my own vulnerability into the experience. And so but but it's hard to it's hard to mount live theater. It's incredibly resource intensive and and um and so we were sort of struggling with how could we how could we capture this experience? Because you had a huge cast. Huge, like 35 people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and also most of those people weren't professional theater artists, you know, and, and they, they put their life on hold for two months while we did this and they weren't probably, probably going to do that again. You know, like most people have jobs and lives and stuff, <laughs> unlike us theater people. So yeah. So for a while we weren't sure how we would share it because, because film of theater, it doesn't really work very well. It's, you know, it's the camera's too far away. It's too flat. It's meant to be more interactive and theater is meant to be sort of fantastical and invite invite your imagination to do some of the work in a way that film, you know, is more realistic. And this was a fantastical story. It was Alice in Wonderland after all. So we had this idea to turn it into a graphic novel because a graphic novel is visual, but it also leaves something to your imagination. It also lets you decide where your eyes going to go. And so we had this idea that in some ways it was the closest to theater of all the art forms we could think of. And luckily we knew an illustrator who was also an actor, so she understood both platforms. And so with my sort of newfound vulnerable strength and understanding that, in fact, this was a little bit about me and I did have a few feelings, <laughs> <laughs> we entered into this whole process all over again with this illustrator to turn it into a graphic novel. And it kind of gave me a chance to rewrite some parts to, you know, make them a little stronger. It also, it's a different platform. So she spent a lot of time going, you don't need so many words, let me draw it, you know, and that really... In, you know, encouraged me to go deeper into, well, okay, what is this moment really exactly about? How do, how do we illustrate? Like, I remember this whole conversation about there's a scene in there where there's there's all these birth mothers singing. It was a musical. I forgot to mention that. So, <laughs> so the graphic novel puts um, the songs in a in a sort of a cursive font and a whole different style to feel like songs. But there was this, there's this scene where the birth mothers are, are singing it. And it's, and it's a song called, So I Had Sex. And she kept drawing the birth mothers all looking sort of hag haggard and weary and mourning. And I was like, yeah, 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 they're sad. But they're also like vehemently not going to be told that they're anything but who they are. You know, I was like, they're, so they're not they're not weeping and mournful. They're they're sort of triumphantly saying, I will be seen. And all of those little subtleties and getting those into the visuals was really cathartic, really cathartic for me because I kind of got to go back and relive every moment in the play and speak my own truth, you know, especially the two main characters are Alice and Jen, who are sisters and both adopted. And Alice is white and Jen is is Korean. And, you know, all the scenes where where they come to terms with their own grief, I just loved talking to the illustrator and going, yeah, no, that's not enough. Go further, go further, you know, of like what the adoptee needs to say. So I will say part of, part of coming out of the fog and finding my own strength was revisiting this whole story again with this amazing illustrator drawing based on like whatever emotions I threw at her. So yeah, that's the long story of my volcano erupting. You know, it still simmers all the time. It's not over. <laughs> it's not over. So now that you've unpacked all these things, <laughs> is there any part of you that thinks, gee, I, you know, what if I could rewind? What if I didn't go to the circles? Wow. Yeah, no, I couldn't. I just couldn't rewind. I mean, and honestly, no matter how difficult it was, I wouldn't because I, I like myself so much better now. Oh, I really do. Even, even though now, like, I mean, I'll, okay, so one of the things that came up in our story circles, a little bit of a, a truism, is wherever there's two adoptees in a family, there's 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 two kinds. This was said to us over and over again. There's the adoptee who acts in and the adoptee who acts out. And the adoptee 
who act out is like, I'm going to push you away before you can reject me. And the adoptee who acts in is like, I will be so perfect that I will never, ever be rejected again. And that's totally me. I always say, mine are the shoes that you'll never trip over. (laughs) You know, like I know how to make myself small and easy and pleasing. And now I I just don't anymore. You know, (laughs) like I realized that was futile. And who the hell was looking at my shoes anyway, right? (laughs) I don't want to go back to being small and perfect and easy. And I probably never was anyway. I doubt I was that perfect, right? I mean, who was I? Who was I tricking? The only person I was tricking was me, probably. And so now I'm not working so hard, which frees energy for so many other things. (laughs) Like, I don't know, laughing and crying and loving with a vulnerable heart, for example. So, yeah, I wouldn't go back. Um, I mean, I wouldn't live those years over again because they were hard, but I wouldn't go back. What has it done for your creativity? Because you already were in a creative profession? It has done a lot, I will say. I've always been a writer, but I have rarely written about me. And I don't just mean that I haven't written memoir, I haven't written autobiography. I mean, I'm never in the story. Here I run a theater company where we gather other people's stories. (laughs) And it was someone else's idea to do the adoption thing, not yours. Yeah. And now, so for example, the, the the most recent project I've been working on with the company is about ambiguous loss, <laughs> and uh, which uh, ambiguous loss, I have to say, is a term created by a psychologist here in Minnesota named Pauline Boss. And it's a really specific thing. I know it's got the word ambiguous in it, so it sounds ambiguous, but it's 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 a big profound loss, but it's not bereavement. It's not when somebody dies. It's she breaks into into two categories. One is when somebody is psychologically very present, but physically absent. So for an adoptee, that's a birth parent. That's a perfect example, right? Like they are present in everything. And yet we don't have physical access to them unless we are able to reunite. But she also talks about somebody who's physically present, but psychologically absent. And so this would be like people with dementia, or mental illness, or even alcoholism, you know, people who are very much in your life, but they're, they're not as present as you might need them to be. And she talks a lot about how because we don't name this loss in our society, we don't grieve it either. And, and she very specifically mentions adoptees and in her book, and that's how I first found out about it. Anyway, flash forward, I've been thinking about ambiguous loss, ambiguous loss, but I've also been because I I work in theater, I'm super aware of the, the role of ritual in grieving. And Theater and ritual have kind of common ancestry. So the latest project I've been working on is a is an interactive participatory ritual for naming and grieving ambiguous loss. And I fully put myself in it. You know, the first version of this contained my own stories. Um, and I've never, ever done that before. And it's kind of terrifying, but it also just feels way more honest than than my past art. You know, and I don't, I don't think this means I'm suddenly going to become someone who just writes memoir all the time or anything. But, but I think... It means that I listen to other people's stories in a different way when I let myself be in the room with them, you know, sharing in the vulnerability of it. I mean, I'm sure you can relate, right? Because you're an adoptee who listens to adoptees and and you can't not be in that. No, no, you can't turn it off. Yeah. But there's like, it's a real gift to be able to sit with, with, fully with someone, you know. Yeah. As opposed to sort of an outside observer taking notes on the side. Right. Yeah. So I guess, you know how I said, I said in the beginning when I was telling my story, I, I, I definitely all my life told a story of myself as the outsider among the outsiders. And I don't think that's the story I'm telling about myself anymore. Mm. You know, I think I'm telling the story of somebody who's finding my way in. Whatever that means. I still don't know if I know what that means, but I'm not like, yeah, I wanted to be out here. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I, I, need, I need to be somewhere where I feel in and where I have family. And, and I, I continue to say, people ask me sometimes if I'm in reunion and I say no. And they say, why not? And I say, well, one, nobody's, nobody's letting me have the information yet. State of California still has closed records and 
there were a lot of adoptions in Los Angeles County in 1968. So research has not been fruitful. But also, I sometimes say, I feel the greatest kinship with other people who are adopted, actually. Like that's that's right now where I choose to find family that feels like people who see me and understand me. When I get this sense from you that you're very much um, you're you're being in, but you're also bringing people in with you like you're a connector. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is still the the I I still love outsiders. Right. I still like, <laughs> come on, everybody. We're all in here. Well, it's so you relatable. Know? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So totally. relatable. Oh my goodness. Well, Alia, I I loved the the graphic novel adaptation. And I'm Thank you know, you. we'll recommend it right away here. And it's so creative and unique and uh special. And to know that the things that the characters are saying are real quotes. <laughs> Every single one of them. Oh. The, the other reason we got excited about the graphic novel approach and, and working with an illustrator who's also a theater artist was we didn't just want to turn the play into a graphic novel. The graphic novel actually captures the play itself. So like you see the actors off stage, you see the intermission. And and I will say the faces, they're all based on the people who really played these parts, most of whom are in the adoption community. You know, so for them to open this book and go, there's me, <laughs> is it, fe- it just feels really good to me as somebody who loves to invite people in and to see all those faces. Because like I said, you know, the, the, the true north of this project became honoring what they shared with us. Mm. And those words, every one of those words either came from, you know, an interview or a story circle, even though it's this wildly fantastical story, uh, but that we felt like that was the only way to capture how shadowy and layered the experience is. But there is there is um, elements of adoption history. Like there's literal decades of, well, this was happening in the 1800s and here we are in the 50s and this is what was happening in the 70s. <laughs> there's like historical accuracy and... <laughs> I just, I don't know how you all manage to weave all of these things together. Like, really, it's remarkable. Thank you. It, you know, it it felt, I think everything I read from history blew my mind. I was like, no way, they did not really do that. No way, they did not really say that. You know, so like, yeah, we felt like that had to be in there. Because if you don't know it, you you, you don't know how we got here. No, that's exactly and I love that you you told us that story of the the um, man who met his first mother for the first time and brought her to the play because it's the scene is right there. <laughs> what page is that? Not a, there's not a page number. There's so. no page numbers. You know what? <laughs> Just like our lives, it can be disorienting. I can't tell you. It's towards the back. There you go. <laughs> it doesn't take you out of it. I mean, I read it so fast just like absorbed and then went back again because I'm like, oh my goodness, I want to see the pictures. And <laughs> it's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. And I'm so, um, I'm sad that I won't likely be able to see it in production. But you have, um, if you buy the book, there's a passcode and you can listen to the songs. <laughs> <laughs> Did you listen? Yes, I listened. I listened a couple times. I listened before we got on the call. I re-listened. And I was like, these are this show was so clever. I really enjoyed it. And so I tried to listen and like look through that section of the book and be connected in that way. So that was my small way into feeling like I was there. <laughs> ah, I'm glad that that worked that way. I think capturing songs was the hardest part. We were like, how do we do this? Because we often used songs to contain many people's points of view at the same time, you know. And so figuring out how to do that on the page was was tricky. Right. Well, in, in lots of musicals, I mean, like, how do I say this? There's you're just it's like a it's a bridge between the scene and the scene and you're kind of mm-hmm. you know telling carrying the story forward so out of context it could feel you know but this it's just 
woven into the story and it just, it's so beautifully done. I think it's um, so smart the way it's. um, Well, and I'll say this, we didn't, this story does not lend itself to the typical musical structure of like, and suddenly somebody starts feeling something and then they sing and then everybody feels better and we're all happy now because that's not the adoption story. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that is the adoption story that's out there, but it's not the true story, right? And so these songs were kind of snarky, some of them, and then some of them were angry. You know, like there's, the song, there's this song between adoptees of color and well-meaning white people <laughs> in which the adoptees of color are like, you did this to me and you did this to me and you made me feel like this and you left out this and you asked me these inane questions about me, you know, and the, and the, and so there's, the songs are actually a little bit more like sometimes an argument or a crescendo of many points of view. Mm -hmm. So in, in that way we had to keep them right. They had to be in there even in the graphic novel. And, but they, they, the fact that they feel more like a conversation than a single person's epiphany actually meant we could capture them as in a graphic novel, you know, right. maybe better than a typical musical could. Hmm. I love that point of view of it. Like, I think that's so good. Wonderful. Well, I obviously I'm recommending the book. It's called in my heart, the adoption story project. And you were a big part of that, even though you're, <laughs> <laughs> There's so many voices represented, obviously, but you're a big part of bringing that to life in this fashion in a graphic novel. Is there anything more you want to tell us about it before you share what you're recommending? Oh, gosh. I just, you know, I think people think that we made this only for people in the adoption community. But my my fantasy is that everybody who's impacted by adoption reads it, feels seen, and then hands it to somebody outside the community and says, it ain't all little orphan Annie. (laughs) Here's the larger story. Because I think, you know, what we experienced with the play was, of course, everybody brought somebody. And out in the lobby, we heard all these conversations where people were like, oh, I had no idea. And now I want to know so much more. And now I want to understand your experience so much more. And then also people outside the adoption community actually some of it did resonate for them. Like the the journey of trying to figure out who you are and how you stand in your truth is not unique to us adoptees. I think we just have a much more intense version of it, <laughs> you know, and so, so, so much of it gets rattled and shaken before we even have language. But, but I think it's, I think it's resonant is what I'm saying. And I think it's, it's, um, I feel super proud of how truthful it is. And I hope it's a tool for other people to, I guess, you know, like just how it was for me, it has become something that cracked open my own ability to speak the truth to myself and about myself. So that's, that's my wish. It goes out there in the world with that wish inside of it. Well, I have so many book charts in my, (laughs) in my copy. Yay. Which is always a sign that there were resonant things for me, as you say, because I feel like there are so many quotes that I'm like, oh, Um, there's this one part where the rabbit is um, saying to Alice, you've made yourself so small, haven't you, Alice, so that you won't bother anyone so that no one will ever reject you again. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> was that from you, Leah? <laughs> it wasn't. But then I was like, oh, actually, it is. Yeah. It might be from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so also for adoptees who are most of our listeners, I would say you may read this and feel very seen by certain characters. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I you know the the story in there that's most me is the one of the powwow. Mm. And the the there was an elder at the powwow. Before the powwow they brought all of us up into a story circle and this this elder said to everybody you believe in your bones that you don't belong in the circle. Before you had words that's what you were told. And so you don't ever step into the circle. But today This circle is you. It's about you. And you need to be brave enough to step into the circle. And, oh, my gosh, I wanted to run. I wanted to flee. Even as he was saying, step into the circle, you know. 
so that's that's I'd say out of all the stories in there, that's the one that was actually mine. Is that that little moment when that memory from the powwow comes in? Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. You can, it's like a special little Easter egg for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what would you like to recommend today? Oh, I struggled with this because I have you know ten bajillion resources that I think are valuable, but I'll say that. I read this book called The Body Keeps the Score that talks a lot about how trauma lives in our bodies. And I read that book even before I did this project because some of the communities we work with have trauma. And I remembered it and I pulled it back out when my volcano was erupting and went, oh, it's in my body. Right. And so that was sort of the beginning of me coming at this kind of with a somatic approach. And I, I, you know, I used lots of things, meditation and yoga and and shaking. <laughs> and, uh, and I just discovered in the last year, ASMR, <laughs> um, auto sensory meridian response. I, I don't think anybody understands what it really is or why it works, but it's a thing. And, and I think just recognizing that my, my body wants to stay clenched and I have to find ways to tell it it's okay. You can, you can release, it's going to, you know, it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. That, that, that conversation with my body has to keep happening. And I think that that started with the body keeps the score. So Maybe that's the resource. So my psychologist has told me that um, ASMR has some bilateral stimulation, right? And so oh. if you're talking about EMDR therapy, yes, you you know you're stimulating left, right, left, right, whatever with paddles or with eye movement with lights or tapping any of those kinds of things. Oh. So the ASMR might be like kind of related to that. So. I'm not a psychologist, but maybe that's why it works. I don't know why it works. I just know it. I, I get like this wave of relaxation and euphoria and I don't even know why. It's wild. It's a very cool thing. And you can look it up on YouTube. You can watch videos mm-hmm. on YouTube, but you have to have both AirPods in or both earbuds yes. in because the left and right sound is different. Like that's the kind of the whole point that you're hearing different yeah. It's a stereo thing. It's in stereo. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, my God, this is my job. Why do I, why am I missing that? Yes, it's in stereo. Unlike this podcast. So yeah, the <laughs> file size is smaller for your uh, downloading enjoyment. Um, <laughs> is that too technical? Maybe I should take that out. No, it's fine. I'm so glad we got to talk, Leah. I love this work and I'm was so inspired by how you came to it. Thank you for sharing how you, you know, experienced learning what adoption really meant in your life. <laughs> Sometimes call it coming out of the fog. Some people, you know, like like that's kind of the language you've landed on, but it's so so it's such a strange experience that no one else understands. <laughs> it's true. So thank you for describing it to us. <laughs> Oh, thank you for letting me talk about it. I feel like I did it backwards. You know, most people, they, I think they, I think they learn about themselves and then they write a story about it. And I accidentally (laughs) wrote a story about myself without realizing it (laughs) by, by inviting hundreds of other people to tell their stories, you know, however we come to it, here we we are, where can we best connect with you online? Our theater company's website is the best place. It's wonderlustproductions.org, which is a really long URL. So you can also get there by typing in wlproductions.org. Perfect. So I will link to that and your other social media handles in the show notes for folks. And that's the best way to order your book, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, you can order it right on the website. And frankly, you know, we do better at covering our expenses if you order it there instead of Amazon. Amazon takes so much. (laughs) I I understand. I understand. Yes. So we will link to that, the book page as well of your site. So yes, I hope that folks order it and uh, come and tell you what this book means to them. Thank you for having me on. I'm such a fan. And thank you for all the work that you do. I, I Every episode, I learned something new, Aww. truly. Well, it's my honor. And now you get to be that for someone else. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> really, seriously, I'm starstruck. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to talk to Leah and bring her story to you today. I am so thankful 
for my Patreon supporters because without them, like this show would not exist anymore. So Patreon is like a crowdfunding platform or a membership platform where you help creators create the things that you want and you get rewards for them and creators get to keep making the thing that you love. If you want to stand with adoptees on and want the show to continue and to continue to grow, especially, I would love to have you join us. Adopteeson.com slash partner has details of how you can join Patreon. There's different levels of support. And when you head over to that website, it shows you which level you get access to the weekly Adoptees Off Script podcast, uh, access to the book club, and access to our private Adoptees Only Facebook group. So there's different levels for different prices, and you can go ahead and check those things out. We also have a couple of scholarships available just for the Facebook group, you know, right into Patreon. Somehow I can't gift memberships yet, <laughs> but... If enough people tell Patreon they want that, um, hopefully we'll be able to do scholarships there too to access the Adoptees Off Script podcast. So in future, <laughs> that's for the future. I am so thankful to the Patreon supporters that have been there with me. Um, new folks, people who've been supporting for years, they make this show possible. So thank you so, so much. I'm so glad you're here listening. And if you want to make sure you catch Adoptees On next week, we upload new episodes every Friday. Make sure you're following or subscribed wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And um, you can just hit the plus button, click on the cover art where you're listening, and you'll, you should see something that says subscribe or follow or add, something like that. And then each new episode every Friday will automatically be downloaded into your app. So I'd love for you to follow along with us. Thank you so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday. 